I am healing. I am healed. I am healed. I am whole. I am whole. Okay, now you're going to inhale through your nose. I am healing. I am healed. I am whole. My name is Dr. Siri Satnam Singh, and I'm a licensed therapist. This week, I'm sitting down with a Grammy Award-winning heavy metal artist who is still processing abuse from his childhood and how it impacts him as a father. He's the lead singer of Slipknot and Stone Sour. This is Corey Taylor. It's the only thing that slowly stops the ache But it's made of all the things I have to take some of your lyrics I whew, they really are very moving oh thank you uh, for a therapist I would be concerned <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. uh, the devil and I that song in particular is one of those things where it was like I had to write that song to be able to figure out how I was dealing with the death of my friend A lot of people who lose people in, in violent tragedy, it's a scar that never heals. It becomes septic, and all of a sudden, everything in your life is polluted by it. We have an addiction to light in this culture. This yeah. is dark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I always say the divine is also in the dark. All of my tattoos, are, are they deal with that. They deal with the duality because you can't have that dedication to good without admitting the fact that there is darkness. I, I, I had a hypothesis that you mask yourself in your childhood. So you have taken your childhood experience and found another one where it's uh, being personified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The situation I was in when I was a kid was difficult. Um, just dealing with abuse, um, moving around a lot, you know. So I really tried to mask it and overcompensate by just running emotionally, mentally. I, I didn't want to deal with a lot of things, mm -hmm. so. It was just you and mom, right? It was me, my mom, and my sister. We didn't have any money, and there was no real protection from a lot of the things that we were being exposed to. Such as? Uh, domestic violence, um, especially against, especially against women, um, especially against us. Sexual violations, like pornography. Yeah, like, yeah, a little bit. Uh -huh. um, Ever seeing adults engage in a sexual act in yeah, front of yeah. you? Or, it was... or hearing noises in the other room? Yeah. and and. And we moved around a lot too, so there was really no sense of safety. You know, I mean, there's something that comes with being able to identify with a certain place and a certain room and a certain safety that comes with it. You know, um, I my bedroom was everything from a closet to a bathtub. So, in a lot of ways, I had to adapt quickly okay. to a lot of different if issues, episodes. Um, and honestly, restructuring of, of people living in the house because boyfriends would come, boyfriends would go. Your father? My dad, I didn't meet my dad until I was 30. Mm. So, I mean, and then, so it, it made you hyper tentative, hyper protective. And um, 
I don't know. It was, Maybe yeah. also contained within yourself because you had no safety. You couldn't share. Yeah. yeah. So you had to hold a lot in. Yeah. Yeah. And it had to go somewhere. Drugs. Mm -hmm. um, what were your drugs in the past? What were they? I was a speed freak when okay. I was a kid. Yeah. Like I could stay up and I could run and I could go and I could mm -hmm. do these things and it. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it almost kind of evened me out. Mm -hmm. yeah, like I, I could yeah, think. Yeah, because you were maybe depressed? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah very, very much depressed. so. Um, when I was 17, I had OD'd for the second time. I was at a party, yeah. and there was a lot of different things flying around. Um, the last thing I remember taking was cocaine, and, and it and then all of a sudden I was waking up in a dumpster. All my friends were gone. Literally a dumpster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With trash and garbage. Yeah, what I think happened was they thought I was dead. And I, you can't call them friends, really. No, I mean, it was, you can't. So that was like the defining moment for me. And that's when I moved. This was in Waterloo, Iowa, where my mom and my sister live. And I moved to Des Moines to live with my grandmother. Um, to, to break that cycle, to get away from it, to, to start new. <sighs> I was... Um... In researching men not raised with their fathers, there's a term that is used, half alive. The father can ignite something in a son that the mother cannot. Interesting, okay. So, like, for example, in African culture, uh, they take the young teens, the elder men, mm -hmm. take the teen, the male teen away, and they put masks on and they do all these rituals and they scare the demons out of them. Really? So you had no male principle there to deal with the demons inside of you. Yeah. So then you acted them out. <laughs> So you did not have that in your life on a consistent basis. Yeah, yeah. So that's why they say half alive. Interesting. So part of you was dead. Uh, to revision your work, uh, I think you're in the mythic world. And myth is the realm of the unconscious. Yeah. And so you're bringing forth, you know, masks and creatures and experiences that are very seemingly dark, but that is the world of the unconscious. Am I making any sense yeah, to absolutely. you? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So uh, I had a hypothesis that you, uh, you, you spoke up, but nobody really heard you. That's why the music's so loud. Mm. It's like this cacophony of sounds that has almost a war experience. To me, it's like this, it's this barrage of music. Okay. And it's like creating a message out of chaos, like reaching your hand into white noise and pulling out the exact message that you wanted to convey in the first mm -hmm. place. So these lyrics, some more of the lyrics, yeah. Oh, the song Bother, of course, just... Yes. That came from a really heavy spot. So talk about your relationship to self-harm. I mean, I, I only really seriously attempted suicide once. How? I, I took a bunch of pills at my grandmother's house and just basically laid on the floor. And my ex-girlfriend's mom stopped at my grandma's house out of nowhere to check on me, to see how I was, found me. An hour later, I'm drinking Ipecac and throwing up into a bucket. What had I, just happened that she got that low? The, the girlfriend whose mother found me had just broken up with me. There was just something about her mm. that I really connected with. Mm. But when that went away, like, a lot of me went with it. Mm -hmm. And I felt so empty mm -hmm. that I, I had a hard time feeling anything other than grave depression. And it was the one time 
I really was just like, I can't handle this. Well, I hear a lot today. I hear that you finally found your heart pulsating. And when she left, you were left with what was there before she came. Yeah. Yeah. This heartless young 17-year-old looking for himself, because also you'd had a lot of abandonment. So this activated, ooh, a lot. Yeah. Am I making any sense to you? Absolutely, no. I, it definitely triggered a lot of things yeah. in me. It was definitely one of my rock bottoms. So my grandmother came and picked me up. My grandmother, who has been the, the one person in my life, she came and picked me up, and she was so disappointed. I could see it on her, you know? And it, and it was like, it was almost like a race of emotion. She was disappointed. She was glad I was okay, but she was so mad. And that killed me. It hurt so much, and I didn't, like it almost put me over again that I immediately just said, okay. It's, it's, it's not. It's not something you come back from. Well, you did. And what I hear is that you're, you really didn't no love existed for you once your girlfriend left, and you found it did with your grandmother. Yeah. And that gave you a reason to live, that you knew you were loved, that somebody had not abandoned you. Somebody was right here with you. So this uh, family that you came from, where you got sort of a challenging start, where are you with it now? And still with the it's, dark it's, that happened here and where you're going now, where, where are you with that darkness now? I feel like the darkness is some place that I visit, like I don't live there. It's there, but it's something I feel like... Um, Let's individualize them. Okay. I like your word, initialize. Yeah. Domestic violence. Hmm. Poverty. Hmm. Instability. Uh, childhood sexual abuse. That would be child, even though you weren't touched. I, well, I wasn't by my family. Oh, okay. I was, I was raped by someone in the neighborhood. Okay. It was an old, yeah. It was a, how old were you? 10. Mm -hmm. um, How old were they? 16. Okay. Where we were living at the time, we didn't, we moved around a lot. So obviously I had to make friends quickly. And there was really only one person to kind of hang out with, play with. And he was this 16-year-old kid, and he would invite me over to his house to play music. And one day, it became something else. And I didn't tell anybody for a long time because he th threatened to hurt me, threatened to hurt my mom. He ended up burning his house down. They they fled in the night. It was kind of crazy. Well, you know, that could attribute to a lot of the acting out behavior. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I never really knew where it came from until you shared that. I, I knew Dad wasn't there and Mom was unstable, but that is a severe psychological wound, especially for a young man. It's very damaging to the psyche and a very unsettling. It took me a long time to feel safe. Yeah. 
that's the real wound. That's the real. I, I never heard it until that. I was. Yeah. That's the real. And then, and you didn't tell anyone until what year? How old were you? Oh, I was. After seventeen. Huh? Yeah. See, that's yeah. all that suicide. That's all that that you didn't deal with the drugs, everything, try the mask, everything. I didn't tell anybody until I was probably eighteen. Yeah. Yeah. And by that time, I'd found my tribe, as yeah, it were, like yeah. my tribe of misfits. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of everything you shared today, that feels like this, the head on the nail of the original sail from which all of your symptoms, your drug addiction, your masking, your s trying to give your heart to someone, them abandoning you, you, again, you felt like you trusted someone and they, you know? Yeah, you yeah. know? So that's the work. All of this other stuff is symptom. Mm. So you are a rape abuse survivor. If you need to go to a survivor's group, you know, a sexual abuse survivor's group, that may help you continue to release that. That's the, that's why all this symptom came about. Yeah. I had I never even thought about that. Yeah, that's, that's, there it is. Just close your eyes for a second and just... And pucker your lips, inhale through your mouth. Exhale through your nose. We're consciously breathing. It's very private. I'm not gonna ask you anything to share that you don't want to. But please have the experience while we're here of healing this wound and all of your subsequent, I'm sure you became sexually promiscuous at times. I'm sure you had periods to where you didn't want to be touched. I'm sure you may have had periods to where you felt sexually inadequate. Go through that now. And feel what you see. Don't run away from it. Open your mouth wide. See that little boy there. Quit fighting, just let the little boy heal. Open your mouth wide just for the last few seconds. Then through your mouth. Through your mouth. Go through the paranoia, the pain. Go through it as much as you can. Live it, see it. You're releasing this stuff. I'm not sitting you in it. I'm trying to get it out of your psyche. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. You just did the work. Let it go. Let it go. Just breathe through your nose. Let it go. You know, the only thing I ever wanted to be was a dad. And then I had, you know, I have three amazing kids. I never want my kids to be, I had never wanted my kids to go through what I went through, you know? So it was very important for me to, right out of the gate, set up college funds, Bills were paid, clothes were bought, food was made, everything. Solid foundation 
They have a place to live. They have a room that's theirs. And they don't have to worry about anything. They're protected. I'm speechless. Usually I have words. This is word therapy, but I have no words. <laughs> I'm just... Uh... Well, we'll close with this. I always give it back to the unknown. I always yeah. enter the therapeutic situation knowing nothing, you yeah. know, yeah. and surrendering to the unknown. So these are angel cards. So just let the unknown communicate to you and just pick a card and see what happens. <laughs> That's about right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. That makes a lot of goddamn sense. Let's just get in on that one. <laughs> Talk about that. It's crazy when you walk in, you think you are pretty aware, pretty awake, pretty in tune, and all of a sudden you realize that maybe there were bits of you that were very much asleep, and suddenly those nerves are awake, and your mind is awake, and you've seen things that maybe you only saw when you were asleep. So that, I think that's very, very fitting. I guess our journey has come to an end. And I look forward to greater things and more success. And I hope you got some resolve today. I feel pretty good about that. Okay, we're done. <laughs>